Welcome to the lecture in philosophy of science. Last lecture I ended with an explanation of concepts classified according to their gradation or scale type and I spoke about quantitative concepts and I explained the difference between interval scale and ratio scale. Uh, I explained that in ratio scales there is just a choice of the unit uh, chosen uh, by pure convention. For instance I mentioned mass as a ratio scale with kilogram as its unit and this choice is conventional, right? I could also take gram or pounds, but there's an objective zero point in masses because if some, <laughs> there's no matter anymore there then the mass is zero, the amount of substance or mass. And this is different in interval scales, I mentioned degree of Celsius as an example. Here not only the choice of the unit is conventional, uh, but also the choice of the zero point. Uh, in, in the case of the degree of Celsius scale, uh, it is conventionally chosen that the temperature of the melting point of water is zero and the unit, one degree Celsius, is defined as one hundredth of the temperature difference between the melting point of water um, and the boiling point of water, right? Yes? I have a question regarding the temperature. What about uh, Kelvin? You mean degree Kelvin as a temperature scale where we have an absolute yeah. zero point? Okay. Well, that's a good question. Um, so far I speak about empirical measurement, right? Or as, as you also call it, fundamental empirical Metrization. Metrization means the definition of a measurement scale and fundamental empirical means that you define your measurement scale purely by means of empirical uh, uh, criteria, criteria, of observable criteria, right? Like like what is the zero point of temperature? I mean, just uh, look, uh, see that certain liquids uh, expand when heated and choose some conventional zero point uh, and choose some conventional unit. Um, in the case of the degree of Kelvin scale, you have what one calls a theoretical or theory-guided metrization. Here, a large amount of background theory is, is needed uh, for this step. In the case of Kelvin, it was the idea, the theoretical uh, uh, hypothesis, which turned out more or less to be true, that the temperature of a gas is proportional to the movement of the molecules, right, to their mean kinetic energy. And also that the gas consists of molecules which are very tiny and the volume of the molecules compared to the, their distance, to their mean, the mean distance between them is neglectably small. So and then it was found out that if you extrapolate the curve, right, the curve between um, volume and, pre and temperature in, in, degrees ke kel in degree uh, Celsius, to, to negative temperatures, right? Then somewhere the volume of a gas should become zero. That happens at minus 273 degrees Celsius. And so the idea was, well, if temperature is movement of molecules, then at that point where the volume becomes zero, no more movement of the molecules is going on. So that should be the true or the physical absolute zero point. And since Kelvin was the one who had this idea, this scale is now called the Kelvin temperature scale, which starts with a zero point corresponding to minus 273 degrees of Celsius. And since then, it was more or less always confirmed that it is not possible to cool down a substance uh, um, more than minus 273 degrees Celsius. You, you even can, cannot reach this value, but you can come very close to it, right? 
Okay, so this is an example what we call a theory guided or theoretical metrization and you see from this example that a scale type of a concept um, when it is after if it has been introduced by some empirical or observational means can be later on changed the scale up can be changed later on on theoretical reasons right so a similar thing happens then in relativity theory okay okay and this concludes the section on the classification of concepts and now i start this um, Today's lecture with my classification of sentences. So here's the classification of sentences and the classification of sentences, the first which I give you, is according to their content type. <coughs> and here you classify a sentence according to the content type quite parallel to the classification of concepts according to the content type. So the classification of sentences follows the classification of concepts which you had the previous lecture. The first distinction is said between analytic and synthetic sentences or statements. An analytic sentence is generally speaking a sentence um, whose truth value is determined by purely semantic conventions of meaning. The truth value is either true or false, right? So they are analytically true and analytically false statements. For instance, the statement this pencil is either blue or not blue is logically true, which is one kind of analytic statement. In contrast, synthetic statements are statements whose truth value depends on the constitution of the world, or in other words, it depends on, on, on what real uh, structures our concepts refer to in, in our real world, to the, as you say, to the extension or reference of the concept. It depends on the extension or reference of the concepts, not just on meaning conventions. For instance, this statement, this pencil is red, is synthetically true. Likewise, that the statement, now the sun is shining, is um, synthetically true. Okay. So this distinction in the end uh, eventually goes back to Immanuel Kant, right? But in modern philosophy of science is still very important. But what is also very important is that there are two different kinds of analytic statements. I will ex explain that later on. They are the logically determined statements, though they are uh, already true because by means of logic. The logically true statements are true just f uh, because of, of the meaning of their logical symbols, because of the, semantic, the logical rules that guide the meaning of their logical symbols and nothing else. This is logical truth. And then there are analytic statements who are determined by definition. Definitorily true statements are such which, uh, uh, like, like say for instance, all bachelors are male, right? In this, this case, uh, their truth follows from the meaning of their non-logical symbols, right? Like all bachelors are either male or not male, that would be logically true. But all bachelors are male are st is still, right? Not synthetically true, it's analytically true, but, but uh, definitorily true. So, I come back to that later. But generally speaking, the idea is that if an, uh, for an analytic sentence, generally speaking, if you understand the meaning of the sentence, you already know whether it's true or false. Right? For instance, if you understand, uh, if I say a rectangle has four corners, right? then that's analytically true. So if I understand the meaning of rectangles, I know that it must have four corners and four edges, four edges, or say four corners. Um, so if someone, uh, a scientist says, well, I make an empirical investigation, I investigate 10,000 rectangles and all of them have four corners, so, that's, so maybe I go on with another 10,000 to, to have a more reliable induction basis here. That would be just silly. It would be a misunderstanding. This guy wouldn't have understood the meaning of corners. And if this guy would apply at, at the research company for, for, for a project, for his project, they would, 
they would say, well, if, well that's, that's, that's silly. So this is an analytic sentence, right? While different for synthetic sentences, of course. Um, okay, for a synthetic sentence, even if you know the meaning of the sentence, you don't know whether it's true. I mean, if you tell me tomorrow it will rain, I fully understand the meaning of the sentence, but I don't know whether it's true. And if you tell me all raven are black, or say all swans are white, right? or whether, say, in Europe there are black swans, for instance, I don't know. I fully understand the meaning if you tell me in Europe there are black swans, but I don't know whether that is true. I mean, I know that there are some black swans in Australia. Do any one of you know? I don't know. You probably don't know either. Maybe there are black men in Europe in some zoos. But we all understand the meaning of the sentence. So that's a, the criteria and those cis sentence is clearly synthetic. Okay. Then let me go on with my classification. Concerning the synthetic sentence, the next important distinction is between um, descriptive and prescriptive sentences. I said synthetic sentences tell us something about the empirical constitution of the world. That's not fully true. That holds only for descriptive sentences. Prescriptive synthetic sentences tell us something about how we think the world should be, right? It's still synthetic to say, well, you should help the poor. Humans should cooperate. Humans should not make war but peace. But that does not describe the empirical constitution of the world. It describes our norm system, how we would like to have it, how the world should be like. The ideal world, so to speak, as you say in theontic logic. But it's a synthetic prescriptive sentence. So the distinction between descriptive and prescriptive sentences is important for philosophy of science on demarcation purposes, as I have explained, right? Of course, the important concepts of science are descriptive concepts and descriptive sentences now, especially sentences we are speaking about here. But you know, remember the value neutrality thesis. Remember that it is a crucial demand, demand on scientific uh, attitude to separate the descriptive statements from the value or norm statements, right? And recall that in order to fulfill the value neutrality, the first and most important step is to make the separation. And if you do the separation, you are quickly forced to reveal, well, because then people will ask you, so where do your value statements come from? And you as a scientist must then differentiate either their instrumental values in the sense explained, hypothetical values which you derive from others by means of a means and inference, that's what practical sciences should do. Or they are fundamental values, and then you must confess, well, this fundamental value is not something which I can justify by means of, of science. I take it from somewhere. Right? It's my personal attitude, or I take it from the politicians for whom I'm working, or whatever. So, actually, the value neutrality requirement in assignment requires this separation, and therefore, this distinction is important here between descriptive and prescriptive sentences and as you will see there are actually two kinds of prescriptive sentences purely prescriptive and mixed prescriptive I come on that come to that later on and between the prescriptive sentences you can all also distinguish between normative and evaluative sa uh, sentences of course norm sentences and value sa sentences because they are norm and value concepts both of them making up the prescriptive concepts and likewise their norm and value statements. Now finally the most important distinction among the empirical sentences now are that between empirical and theoretical sentences. And this distinction follows completely in parallel, it just follows, you know, the distinction between empirical and theoretical concepts which we introduced last unit. We introduced the notion of an observation concept, you know, as a concept which is learnable by pure extension, right? So this corresponds to a notion of empirical in the very narrow sense of being perceptible, perceptible exp exp uh, of, of uh, being observable by the human senses. Then we had the notion of empirical concepts, like this disposition, empirical disposition concepts. And likewise, we here have 
Among the empirical statements, we have the distinction between the observation sentences here. So you see now the mouse here, not the laser pointer, but the mouse pointing to, to, this, uh, to the slides. And here you have the general empirical sentences. Among the theoretical sentences, you also can distinguish between purely theoretical and mixed theoretical sentences, and I'll explain that now, uh, soon. So, that is first, let me, uh, in what follows, I will explain all notions of this classification in more detail. First of all, let me explain this notion of empirical and theoretical statements. First of all, how can we define an observation sentence? Here's the definition on observation sentence. Well, it's a singular sentence which contains, apart from logical concepts, only observation concepts. That's a standard definition. For instance, this raven is black, right? This raven is black. Usually, you say in, 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 in the standard uh, uh, definition in analytic philosophy of science that, of course, this raven is black, then also the negation of, some, of an observation sentence is an observation sentence, like this raven is not black. And then also the conjunctions of observation sentences are observation sentences, like this raven is black and this pencil is red. It's also an observation sentence. Or the, uh, of course, the conjunction can go longer and longer, can go longer and longer, right? So, this person is brown-eyed, and that person is brown-eyed, and that person is blue-eyed, and that person is brown-eyed, and so on. It's always an observation sentence. But of course, there is now some, some kind of cognitive complexity bounds of humans, right? I mean, if the conjunction gets too long, uh, it's, it's no longer observable, it blows the bounds. And this, this bound somehow is, of course, dependent on technical, on technical means, right? I mean, uh, uh, today with, with huge uh, computers, uh, trillions of data points are still observable in some sense. And there's a special field even in, in, say, in weather forecasting science, called, or in other uh, stock forecasting, it's called data mining, where you have this huge data bases containing trillions of data and they search for certain patterns. But still, every, every high-powered computer has, of course, from the mathematical viewpoint, it has its complexity bound. And from the mathematical viewpoint of infinities, 10 to the power of 18 is still small <laughs> compared to all natural numbers which are larger. So, you know, um, at some point when the, when the conjunction gets, so to speak, too long or potentially infinitely long, uh, the so sentence is no longer observa observable, but, but then it is a hypothesis, then it's an empirical hypothesis. And the clearest case, of course, of empirical hypothesis are universal sentences which range, um, which range over a potentially infinite class of objects, like all raven are black, because that ranges over all potential ravens in the future. That is a clearest case. But even if I say all ravens in the last hundred years on this planet have been and are black, it's still right, um, not observable, I mean, practically. So we still say it's, a, it's, it's, it's not an observation sentence, it's an empirical hypothesis. But if I have a sentence like all apples in this basket are black, and here's this example now, right? Um, then this, obviously, this sentence is observable, right? All apples in this basket are, are black is observable, and we, uh, we call it a localized quantified sentence, because here the range of the quantifier is spatio-temporally restricted. It refers only to this back basket, and we know by the empirical meaning of apple, there can only, at most, be a few apples in there. So it is clear that the truth, truth of this sentence can be found out by pure observational means, without any inductive uh, generalization step. Okay? So, summarizing, observation sentences are singular sentences which contain only observation concepts or logical concepts, or localized quantified sentences referring to a restricted spatio-temporal region which is small enough to be observable. Good. The second kind of uh, empirical sentences are empirical generalizations. 
So generally speaking now, an empirical sentence may be an observation sentence or an empirical generalization. So generally the, the definition of an empirical sentence is, is a sentence, just sentence which contains, apart from logical concepts, only empirical concepts. But the sentence may contain now unrestricted existential or universal quantifiers. And that's an empirical sentence, example, all raven are black. What is the point here between distinguishing between a general empirical sentence and a theoretical sentence? Very important. All raven are black is of course a hypothesis, a hypothetical empirical sentence. It's not verifiable. We cannot never be sure whether it's true or not. We can only probabilistically confirm it. But the inference from observations to empirical generalizations is purely inductive, right? In the explained sense, in the induction, in the narrow sense. There is no abductive step involved here. It's just a generalization of an observed pattern, observed so far, to the future, to future observer, observed instances. So empirical sentences do not introduce, do not contain latent variables, which are not in the, in the data, right? They do not contain latent or theoretical concepts, as you call them, which are not contained in the description of the data. And this is a crucial distinction to theoretical sentences. They contain theoretical concepts. So the inference from observations to theoretical sentences exceeds what induction in the, in the narrow sense does. It's more than generalizing observational patterns to the future or to unobserved domains. It, it, it means in assuming theoretical entities, unobserved entities, hidden models, hidden structures, models about unobserved entities. So that is the content of theoretical sentences. And what you mean by a theory is just a system consisting of some theoretical principles, axioms, some derived empirical statements, and so on. I will come to that later on. So among the theoretical sentences, um, they are purely theoretical and mixed theoretical sentences, but generally speaking, a sentence is theoretical if it contains Threaded concepts, besides logical concepts, but it may also contain empirical concepts, of course. That is also important. An example would be atoms consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons, for instance. That would be, a, I would say, a purely theoretical sentences because it, all concepts contained in it are theoretical. Atoms, protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? Or in the center of our galaxy, galaxy, there is a black hole. So this is a general theoretical sentence. This is a singular theoretical sentence. A singular theoretical sentence, right? So there are also singular theoretical sentences. Like, there is an electron, but you don't see it. Right? Or there are trillions of electrons here on, on this white, but you don't see them on this white board here. Um, but there are also, of course, uh, mixed theoretical sentences, like, for instance, um, like force equals mass times acceleration, acceleration, right? This is a mixed sentence of Newtonian mechanics. This is theoretical. This concept is also theoretical and this is empirical. Like force and mass are considered a theoretical concept. Acceleration is co considered as empirical concepts. Right. Um, so this is an example of a mixed theoretical sentence. It is important uh, for my account, which is a minimal empiric empiricist account, for instance like that for Van Fasen, that theories contain bridge principles, mixed theoretical sentences which connect empirical concepts with theoretical concepts. Not all philosophers of science see that. For instance, Chalmers or Gwein, also Putnam, right? They argue in some places of their writings that if an empirical concept enters into a system of theory, then it becomes theoretical in, them, in some sense. So I don't say that at all. I don't say that the, 
concept of water, being part of chemistry, of the theory of chemistry, becomes now a theoretical concept. Because that does, if you speak in that way, we are no longer allowed, it's no longer possible to separate the empirical content of a theory from a theoretical part. And it's even not, not longer possible to, to specify, so to speak, the observable, the empirically testable consequences of a theory. So consider this uh, equation, water equals or is equivalent with H2O, right? So in my account, this is a mixed theoretical sentence, right? Because we have the this is the empirical concept of water. This empirical concept is introduced by means of an ostensive characterization. This is water. This liquid is water, and all liquids which are very similar to, to this, which are similar to this, water tastes like it, etc. Have the same observable properties. Are water. This is the empirical concept of water, which we humans have, and humans have it, which, which, which humans have it who don't know anything about chemistry. They still have this empirical concept of water, right? You can drink it, it tastes, that's, that's clear. And then we have the concept of H2O, which presupposes a huge amount of chemistry. They are molecules. Substances consist of trillions of molecules. Molecules consist of at atoms which are bounded together by means of chemical bonds. Water consists of molecules which have the form H2O, which have this structure, right? And there are these two electron pairs. That is, <laughs> that is a chemical model. Now, this is of course a different concept. This is a theoretical concept. And the chemistry just uh, asserts that the empirical, what we empirically call water, is, has the chemical structure H2O. And this is, as in my account, not something which is a a, a posterior necessity, as Kripke or Putnam have it, right? And it's also not some kind of semantic statement like Quine has it when he say, well, now water turns into a theoretical concept that turns into a definition. No, it's an empirical prediction of the chemical theory, and you can test it, right? For instance, you can test that in the, in the famous chemical reaction, hydrogenium gas and oxygen gas forms hydro, hydro-oxygen gas, which by loud sound uh, uh, forms then water, H2O. And these two gases mixed produce, and the prediction is they produce water, and indeed they do. After the explosion, namely, you see all these droplets, and, and if you taste the droplets, you see that's water. Right? So it's a, a, a confirmable prediction. This is a mixed theoretical right statement, a bridge principle. All empirically condensable theories need bridge principles connecting with empirical with theoretical concepts, and this is an empirical prediction of the chemical theory. This is the account which I and, and, and the philosophy of science which I um, teach here, um, defend and uh, think which is that account which really fits to, uh, to science. Okay, so any questions so far, maybe on this point or maybe on definition question or whatever? If no, then I proceed I proceed to the next thing. Um, well, here I have uh, also mentioned the notion of uh, the notion of a t-theoretical concept and a t-theoretical sentence. By that you mean just a theoretical sentence which ex is explained and explicated within a theory t. For instance, force is t-theoretical in regard to the Newtonian theory to the classical physics theory T, right? Um, but that is just a, a mentioning at the margin. Okay, so we have clarified the meaning of empirical, observational empirical theoretical sentence. Um, we now come to a next uh, important thing, namely the meaning of what a purely descriptive and a purely prescriptive sentence. You know, re recall that this distinction is important um, in science to demarcate value statements or norm statements from factual statements. 
So how should we define it? Given that we have a notion of a prescriptive concept, we know what it means to be a norm concept and a value concept, how do we now define the notion of a norm sentence or a value sentence? It would seem that the right definition as well as sentence is purely descriptive if it contains no prescriptive symbol, right? But, but that definition is too narrow. Does anyone, can anyone give me an example of a sentence which contains, uh, which is descriptive or thought? Yes? Uh, just, a, <coughs> just a regular normal descriptive sentence combined with a conjunction of a, with a sentence which has prescriptive content if it's, it's its autology. No. So this is after yeah. either and it's wrong to kill or it's not wrong to kill. Uh, but that is not descriptive. It's wrong to kill or not wrong to kill. That is in my classification a prescriptive sentence, a purely prescriptive sentence. It's a logical it's logically true. But this classification includes it includes in the prescriptive sentences both the analytically true prescriptive sentences and the synthetic prescriptive sentences. It's that is prescriptive to say it's wrong to kill or not to kill. So some the the conjunction here is, is logically equivalent to this is now. But this classification is not invariant under logical equivalent transformation. I have a chapter on this on the book. You can refine the classification uh, to a classification which is then invariant under logical equivalent transformations. That's a very good point. Then you have the notion of essentially descriptive. As an essentially descriptive statement would be a, a statement which is descriptive in this sense. Uh, would be a statement for which at least one logical equivalent transformation is descriptive in this sense, right? I mean, but, but that is a complication. Let's leave that out. That is already a more advanced question. Um, so, but there's a very simple reason uh, why this uh, is not enough, yes? Um, I think that Allah is a nice person. I think, yeah, exactly. Remember when we discussed exactly the value neutrality thesis in Max Weber, we said that science may of course um, um, discover factual value assertions of people as facts, right? And this means that these dis value statements are in the, in the scope of an of a, of a operator like a person believes or a person thinks, right? So, Peter believes that, and now comes something like Anna is Anna is a good mother, for instance, or a good person. Then this contains, of course, a prescriptive concept, but it is descriptive because it's a fact. And if that would not be counted as a fact, then social <laughs> science would not be possible in a way comp incompatible with the value neutrality statements. So that is a much more simpler thing. Okay. So what shall we do? In, so in order to find now the notion of a descriptive concept in a satisfying way, we need the notion of a subjective attitude operator. A subjective attitude operator is logically speaking an intentional operator, a, a fat clause operator, which describes the attitude of a subject, of a person, towards a proposition. And it's, it's for instance, person, a person, P or X, thinks fat. And then you have a sentence P. That is a subjective attitude operator. Thinks that. Or believes that. Or wishes that. Or doubts that. And, and so on. Says that. These are all subjective attitude operators. And given this uh, subjective attitude uh, uh, operator notion, we can say that 
If P is a normative sentence or a prescriptive sentence, then P loses its descriptive, its P loses its prescriptive force whenever it occurs in the scope of a subjective attitude operator. In other words, a subjective attitude operator is a neutralizing operator in regard to prescriptive force, right? It neutralizes, it eliminates the prescriptive content. It turns a prescriptive into a descriptive statement. So we can define a sentence is purely descriptive if either it contains no prescriptive concept, I mean that's a, that's a special case, or if every prescriptive concept occurring in it lies in the scope of a subjective attitude operator. Right? Every prescriptive concept occurring in the sentence lies in the scope of a subjective attitude operator. That's the definition of purely descriptive. And as, as a special case, this is true if it contains no prescriptive concept, of course. So the subjective attitude operators meant to rely on sort of factive operators? The subjective attitude operators are what are? It's meant to rule out sort of factive operators. Yes. Like, uh, Knowing. They know or they see that. Very good question. If you now ask, what is the precise, so to speak, definition of a subjective attitude operators, it characterizes an attitude which does not entail the truth value of P. So that's, it's a subjective part. So knowing, person knows that P would no longer be a subjective attitude, attitude operator, because according to the standard definition of knowledge, if a person knows that P, then that implies P is true, though it's more than describing a subjective attitude, right? So it's no longer purely descriptive. If I say, this example, Peter knows that Anna has a good character, I make an implicit moral assertion here. But if I say, Peter believes, so I'm neutral whether to the truth value, Peter believes that Anna has a moral character, then I make a purely factual assertion. This is right. There's also intermediate cases too, like they, they have evidence that... Um, they, they have, uh, um, Peter has evidence that, then that has a weak moral content. And I must confess, that is already a question which belongs to an advanced course. We would have to introduce now probabilistic notions of content. But you're right, it's, it has a weak probabilistic, it, it, makes a, it implies a probability of a moral judgment, if you say something like has evidence. Uh, I don't include that, but it's a good remark. So you have, have these cases. But uh, a purely subjective attitude operator, wouldn't do that, right? Wouldn't entail that. I, I'm neutral, even in regard to the probability whether this moral, whether the belief of this person is true. I just be, describe the beliefs of that person, and that is a, a, a demand which a lot of uh, scientific communities in sociology really require. That you, if you investigate foreign cultures, you should keep neutral towards the the, the, the truth value or, or the truth likeness of, of the beliefs of this culture. Okay, so how do we then define the notion of a purely prescriptive sentence? Well, a notion of a purely uh, a sentence is purely prescriptive if all of its, de if its descriptive components lie within the scope of a prescriptive operator. I mean, that's a little bit logical uh, involved now, but you know, a, a descriptive component is just any sub-sentence any sub-sentence or, or sub-formula, formula, yeah, any sub-sentence or sub-formula <laughs> of the sentence. <coughs> and this means, in other words, that the sentence is purely prescriptive if all of its elementary sub-sentences or sub-formula are also elementary prescriptive. What is elementary? What does that mean? That is a logical notion. I'm, mention it just at the, tech, at the margin because it's technical, but elementary means a sentence is elementary if it's not composed from substances by means of propositional operators or quantifiers. But uh, there are elementary modal sentences like Peter thinks that P, right? That is also elementary. But P and Q is not elementary 
and P or Q is not elementary too. So a purely prescriptive sentence is, so to speak, consists of, of a propositional uh, uh, quantified combination of, of purely of, of, of sentences of the form something is good or something is obligatory, or the negation of them. And the third category is the sentences of the class of mixed sentences. Well, they are mixed otherwise. So then they, a mixed sentences has both descriptive and prescriptive elementary subsentences, right? So this means that a sentence is mixed. And to get that classification uh, uh, a little bit uh, filled with examples and a little bit more, um, um, get, to get more life into this logical classification, I give you now some examples. For instance, um, could you please tell me what you think uh, what, what the character of these uh, sentences is? Uh, for instance, Peter believed that stealing is bad. What, did, what would you say? This is descriptive, exactly. This is descriptive because you see, uh, let me, that uh, um, That we have here this uh, prescriptive concept bad, but it lies in the scope of the subjective attitude operator beliefs. So the whole sentence is bad. It's uh, descriptive. Next example would be stealing is bad. Yeah. Elementary normative, right? Or elementary value statement. Elementary because it's not composed by means of proposition, logic, or quantifiers. And, well, it's just elementary. It's even atomic. Something is bad. Stealing is allowed for a person if this person is suffering from hunger. If a person suffers from hunger, then stealing is allowed for the person. Yeah. Right, so there's a descriptive part. Exactly. If this person is suffering from hunger, but yes. there's also a prescriptive part, so it's a prescriptive sentence. No, it's, it's a mixed That's sentence. mixed sentence. Exactly. It's not purely prescriptive. And this classification is mixed. And this sentence is very important, a very important challenge, so to speak, for formal ethics and theontic logics and, 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 and uh, formal investigations. Sorry. Um, because, you know, um, sentences of the form, if a certain descriptive condition is satisfied for an agent, agent say A, then a certain norm applies to an agent A, or a certain right applies to an agent A, they are very important in ethics. They have ethical content too, although they are mixed. They are called conditional obligations or conditional permissions. or conditional permissions or conditional rights, right? So you see, certain mixed uh, uh, sentences have ethical content, right? That's uh, important. It's important to separate these three groups from each other on several reasons. Because mixed sentences also co um, establish a certain connection between desperate facts and normative statements. Actually, in ethics, I mean, and, and in law, you have these two things. You have first at least in modern, modern civilized and enlightened, so to speak, non-fundamentalistic uh, worldviews, you have the idea that certain rights are, in, in some sense you have it uh, in all worldviews. You have the idea that certain rights are universal, right? The universal human rights belong to all humans. All humans have them independent of their sex, their gender, their birth, the nation where they come from, independent from what they, what they have achieved, how rich or poor they are, and so on. Now these are the unconditional rights. And then there are the conditional rights. They are dependent on what a person has achieved. So only if you have a driver's license, you have the right to drive a car. If you are belonging to the police, you have the right to take a person into prison, but only if you are police. Right? And so on and so on. If you have a certain education, you have the right to, to, uh, to um, execute a certain profession, right, or a certain job, and so on. So these are all conditional obligations, and they are very important uh, in our uh, 
actual system of legal norms and laws. Okay. Next example. Peter believes that stealing is bad, although he is a thief himself. What is that? Descriptive. Yeah. So this is a descriptive sentence. Although it's it's like a conjunction. It's, it entails a conjunction. Peter is believes that stealing is bad, and Peter is a thief himself, and that is. Is a thief himself also a descriptive statement? So it's a descriptive statement. Then, if stealing is permitted, then there exists no right to private property. Again, an if sentence. What do you think? That's again an example where some people say, well, this is descriptive because it's, it's somehow analytically true, right? But as I said, my classification considered uh, allows for analytically true uh, prescriptive statements, of course, right? So the definition uh, um, implies what in that case? What do you think? Prescriptive. Exactly. So because it has an if part, stealing is permitted. That is prescriptive. It has a sign part, there exists no right to private property. That is prescriptive. And by definition, every proposition combination of prescriptive sentences is prescriptive. And, and that's a very important definition because if you define it otherwise, I cannot explain the technical details. But, but I mean, I, uh, following from many research and logical papers on that, to have th this kind of distinction is very important for several purposes. So it, it is a prescriptive statement. And if then, and if then connections between two prescriptive statements, and therefore a prescriptive statement itself. Although it's, it, it's certainly true that this statement is analytically true, given a certain definition of the notion of a right. Of a right. So, next example. Peter has good brakes. Peter's car, sorry, not Peter. Peter's car has good brakes. You would say descriptive, although the notion good occurs in it. Why would you say descriptive? Because um, I could say his brakes um, have a, fun a good function. Or I see. Yeah. Exactly. You're, exactly. I agree with you. Here the notion of good is, so to speak, a purely instrumental or a hypothetical value. It, it means good brakes which are good for a clearly defined purpose, namely uh, the braking power, and you can replace good here by a descriptive sentence like Peter's car has brakes with a, with a high braking power, or maybe even more precise, the braking distance as a function of the weight of the car is such and such, right? And which is, which is good among, compared to others, which is better, shorter in that case than others the braking distance. Yeah. Difference from this sentence, Peter has a good character which is purely normative, purely prescriptive, purely evaluative in that case. Good is a value statement, so sorry. It's purely prescriptive, more specifically purely evaluative. Because here the notion of a good character is, is a morally loaded notion and no one can define. There's no agreed definition of a good character. I mean that would really uh, go against certain principles in ethics. What goodness means is part of ethical theories, right? And not something which is analytically given. Okay, so far. And there, thereby, we end this part of the lecture and come to the next part. The next part is the following. The next part is to say what it means that a sentence is logically true, you know. Uh, logically true. So, to make it a little bit more hidden. Um, what does it mean that a sentence is logically true? We already said it roughly. Um, well, a sentence is logically true if the truth follows from logic or so on, but can we characterize it more precisely? Yes? Okay. Well, in the history of philosophy, it was usually said that logical truths are truths 
which are necessities of thinking, right? You know, find that already, you find that in Kant, in Leibniz, etc., very long, until uh, 100 years ago you find that. Because modern logic uh, arised some in the 20th century somehow, uh, with predecessors at the end of the 19th century, Poole and so on, but in the 20th century actually. But not earlier. So, if you, if you say a, lo a truth of logic is a necessity of thinking, that is vague, because pe people have lots of ideas about what is a necessity of thinking. Some people think that the existence of God is a necessity of think thinking. Some people think that the existence of God and the existence of Satan is a necessity of thinking too. Right? Some people uh, think that that, that uh, whatever is a necessity of thinking, so it's it's really not clear, right? what is the necessity of thinking. There were different ideas about necessity of thinking in philosophers, in philosophy, in the development, in the historical development of philosophical ideas. Right? Uh, for some people it was a necessity of thinking that the earth, the planet earth, the earth, our earth, the notion of planet didn't exist at that time. The earth is in the center of the universe, right? Some people thought it was a necessity of thinking that a geometry is Euclidean. But all these so-called necessities have turned out to be not, not necessities, even not to be contingently true. <coughs> so, modern logic, and on, on modern logic, philosophy of science is based. Modern logic wanted to have a clear, clearly defined notion of a logical truth. And here is it. A sentence is logically true if every sentence of the same logical form is true. In other words, a sentence is logically true if its truth depends only on its syntactic structure and on the meaning of its logical contents, concepts. That is the definition of logical truth, which I give you and which you see in many but not in all textbooks. The advantage of this notion of logical truth is that it holds for all logical systems. It's independent of a particular logical system. While in, in some textbooks of logic you often find specialized a notion of a logical truth which depend on, on, on the logical system and the logical op op operations. But this definition is very general. And uh, you will see it applies to all kinds of logical systems if you really go into logic. So, um, you know, if the truth of a sentence depends only on its syntactic structure and on the meaning of its logical concepts, but it's independent both on the meaning and on the reference of the non-logical concept, then it is logically true. Then, every sentence of the same logical form has to be true where the logical form of a sentence is, is, uh, is um, produced or constructed um, if you replace all non-logical symbols of the sentence by variables. Variables are just dummy letters, right? And then you really see, this is a test, the decisive test criterion here to see whether a sentence is logically true, replace the non-logical symbols by variables and see whether you still can say that the sentence must be true. If you still can say that after it, then it has to be true by, uh, by, uh, by logic, so then it is logically true. Let's do that. For instance, here is a sentence which is an example of a logically true sentence. Um, if all men are mortal, then there exists no man who is immortal, right? Right? Um, I mean, that must be logical, that must be true by means of logic. How, how can we see that? Well, let's replace the non-logical concepts of this sentence by variables. So re we replace now man by F, man by F, and mortal by G. Then we arrive at if all f are g, then there exists no f which is not a g. And now we see every sentence which has this form, whatever f and g mean, and whatever f and g refer to in our real world, independent from that, the sentence will always be true. And therefore, this is a def definition of logical truth. Okay. So you see, this gives you a nice definition, a quite clear definition. If you also know the formulas of first-order logic and the notations, 
then the full formalization then gives you this uh, logical formula for all x. If x is an f, so if it's the case that for all x, fx implies gx, then it's not the case that there exists an fx which is not the gx, right? Okay. In contrast, a synthetically true sentence is just a sentence whose truth is not determined by the logical form and also not by the meaning of the logical concepts, of course, that comes later. But not determined by the, also not by the uh, meaning of the non logical concepts, but that con 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 comes later. For instance, here, all men are mortal, all effigies, right? It's, it, this is synthetically true, right? It's not true by definition, and it's not true by logic that all men are mortal, right? And you see, the logical form is all f g. So of course, uh, it depends on on to what, uh, what what f and g refer to in the real world, whether the sentence is true or not. Okay. In the same way, as I explicated here, the notion of the logical truth by means of consideration of the logical form, in just the same way, we can explicate what it means that an argument is logically valid. We do this here. An argument, what is an argument? An argument is an inference from some premises to a conclusion, just recall. So an argument or an inference is logically valid if for every argument which has the same logical form the following holds, if all premises are true, then the conclusion is true. So this is a definition of logical validity in close analogy to the definition of logical truth. By, by the means, of course, we can also, here, we can also define the notion of a logically false sentence. I didn't say that, but I do it now. We can, of course, also defini define in analogy here the notion of a logically false sentence as a sentence uh, uh, whose logical form is false. So every sentence which has a logical uh, it's the same logical form is false. Then we say the sentence is logically false. That is just analogous. And then we have here, come back to the argument, an argument is logically valid if every argument of the same logical form has a property that if all premises are true, the conclusion is true. So let us uh, see how we, how we apply this uh, definition in practice. So here we have an example. All humans are mortal you are a human, therefore you are mortal. Right? This argument is obviously valid and um, we see that by applying our test criterion, so we construct the logical form of the sentence, replace humans by f, mortal by g, and we get all f are g. This is an f, therefore this is a g. And we see every argument of this form must have the property that if the premises is, are true, then the conclusion is true. It is true, must be truth preserving. It's, by the way, uh, a very classical argument scheme. And uh, Aristotle called this syllogism modus barbara. Here's the full formalization of the argument on the right side. And you see the test return works, and you see the argument is valid. By the way, the validity of this argument is a matter of the logical form, but it does not depend on whether the premises are true or not, right? It just says, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true, right? It could be um, that all humans sometime are, sometime they are immortal humans, maybe, maybe biological genetics, genetic engineering comes so far to construct an immortal human. I don't know. It's very improbable, but the validity of the argument is independent on the, of the question whether the premises are true. Right? That is important. And see, the logical form, you cannot know from the logical form whether the premises are true, but you can know from the logical form that the argument is valid, that if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Good. Um, Here's an example of an invalid argument. All humans are mortal. This living being is mortal. Therefore, this living being is human. Though here you conclude or infer 
from the then component of an if then sentence, right? Mortal. If someone is a human, then he is mo he or she is mortal. The then component to an, to the if component of an if then sentence. From mortal to being human, and we know this inference is not valid. So it has not the premise, the property that if all premises are true, the conclusion is true. Well, and you see this again by constructing the logical form. The logical form is here. All f's are g's. This is a g, therefore this is an f. And it's of course easy to construct examples for, a, for certain interpretation of f and g's where this is false. Um, can you give me a, a counterexample? For certain interpretation of f, g and a in particular where this is false, where the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Yes? You're just if the living being is an animal. Exactly. If a is a dog. All humans are mortal, this dog is mortal, therefore this dog is a human. Exactly. Two premises, false conclusion. So we know this inference is, this inference, sorry, is not logically valid. Good. So you see, this concludes the definition of what it means to be logically true, logically false or logically valid. And you see that these definitions are quite clear and quite precise. Now finally I turn to the last thing. What does it mean that a sentence is true by definition of non-logical symbols? Like all bachelors are male. So this is now more subtle. What is extra logical and analytical truth? Here is the definition. A sentence is definitely true, as I say, or extra logically analytically true, if its truth is determined by certain, by certain conventions of meaning for its non-logical symbols. That is the difference now. So the, the truth of an extra logical analytical truth depends on the meaning of the non-logical symbols and the syntactic structure, of course. While the truth of a logical, logical truth sentence, a logical truth depends only on the meaning of the logical concepts. That is the difference. And the, the, the conventions of meaning for non-logical concepts like bachelor are somehow entrenched in the underlying language or linguistic community. That is the point here. And that of course makes this notion in some situations or in some domains uh, somehow vague. Okay. Look at these two examples. All bachelors are unmarried. And that is an analytically true statement, but its truth does not depend on the logical form of the sentence. All F are G, right? The same form as whatever. All ravens are black. But here it's just a convention of our language that bachelors are unmarried. Yeah. Or the length of the standard measure in Paris is one meter. You know, the standard measure in Paris is this platin iridium bar, uh, which is a certain bar which doesn't change its, its length and has been used as a definition of that is one meter. And that was the definition of phys which physicists used until the last century, in, this, in, last, in, in the 20th century, then they invented even more precise ways of defining one meter, but that was one, one, uh, one very long, uh, one, one convention, one definition which w was very long in force. So that is also the truth by definition. It's not a logical truth, it's a truth by definition. Here, you see that by comparing these two examples with the next examples, on the slides, examples of synthetic sentences. For instance, all polar bears are white. That is a synthetic sentence. I mean, that's not contained in the definition of a polar bear that it is white, I would say. But you see, it has just the same logical form as that sentence here. So you can see from the logical form that this, sen that this sentence is analytic and this sentence is synthetic. You c only can infer that from the semantic conventions which are accepted in the language. Or the length of this rod here, like assume I have a rod here, uh, is one meter. That is a synthetic sentence. Okay. 
Um, uh, a slight remark, maybe, um, on, um, on Quine. You know, Quine was a philosopher. Willem von Ornum Quine, very famous uh, philosopher, who pointed out in, in, as a criticism of, of Rudolf Carnap, right? He criticized Rudolf Carnap. For Rudolf Carnap uh, uh, is fond of, is, 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 is famous for uh, introducing this modern way of, of, of distinguishing between synthetic and analytic statements. <coughs> also, he didn't, uh, the distinction between logical and extra logical analytic tools uh, is not so important in Carnap. That's uh, something which, which came, came up later and which is really very important too. <coughs> but Quine pointed out that the distinction between analytic sentences and synthetic sentences is vague. Important here is to note that the Quine criticism applies only to extra logical tools, but not to logical tools, because given you know what the logical symbols are, the distinction between logical tools and non-logical tools is not vague. It's absolutely cla uh, class clear, right? Crystal clear. But of course, the distinction between extra logical analytic tools and synthetic tools is vague as as far and uh, in so far the concepts, the non-logical concepts on whose meaning the analytity of the sentence depends, are characterized in natural language. Because in natural language communities, there is no one who explicitly stands up and this, says, "This is a definition of a table." For instance, to, to, uh, to um, explain Quine's criticism, who has ever defined what a table is? Right? Does a table have to have four legs? What would you say? Is this analytically true? No. We are a table with three legs. What if, if I give you a table with two legs? Which falls down? Then it's not a table, right? Long leg, leg. Yeah, something. I don't know. But does a table, a table has a board, or a plate, how do I say it? I say it, a board. A horizontal board. What if you, a table with a, with a non-horizontal but inclined board, would that be a table? I mean, it's difficult. No one has really defined that clearly. And you know, in this, in this respect, Quine is true that for natural language system, the distinction between analytic, extra logical analytic and synthetic tools is often vague. But on the other hand, in technical convention systems, like the European DIN norms, DIN norms for industry standards, or all uh, measurement conventions, here you have norms which are clear, which are clear. So for instance, that one meter is 100 centimeter. That is surely analytic. I mean, some, no one would say, well, but it's vague. Well, the, the, in, in Poland, one meter is 99 centimeter, and in Finland, it's 101 centimeter, right? In Germany, it's 100 centimeters, let's say. <laughs> but no one would speak in that way. I mean, that would be ridiculous. But that is explicitly, there's an explicit convention. There's, there are rules for that, right? And that in Germany, uh, red light means, and not in continental Europe, a red light the traffic system means stop and green light means go. That is a, that is a convention which is strict, right? It's, no one says, well, it's vague. Well, in southern Italy, red light means, well, if you want, you can go too. <laughs> well, no one would say that. But, but uh, on the other hand, Quine is right that in the domains which I just explained to you, in linguistics you call it also prototype concepts, there, the distinctions, uh, the definition of analyticity is, is really very vague, and it's unclear whether certain sentences are analytic or not. Good. Any questions so far? Yes? Um, where do um, mathematical statements, where were they lived in, in this text? Or mean, like, some statements to the fact that, that some mathematical claim is a, is a true mathematical Yeah. Well, the, the, the mathematical statements can either be definitions or meaning postulates, which are not definitions. That's my view, right? But um, 
Yeah. So, um, for instance, space, three-dimensional space, is characterized by meaning by the axioms of Euclidean geometry, which have, which are meaning postulates for space, and. What meaning postulates are, I, I will say soon. Um, but you see, if you do it in that way, you have to specify, of course, the Euclidean concept of space. There is a non-Euclidean concept of space too. And the concept of space in general would be characterized by much weaker meaning postulates. But I would say they are meaning postulates, as long as long as the concept is really mathematically, or not a physical concept of space. As long as it's mathematically, we don't say anything about how it relates to the world. So it, it, it are meaning postulates. But when I say that this is a true, physically true concept of space, then I make synthetic statements. That's how I would say that. And this brings me already to the next thing, meaning postulates. There are three different kinds of analytic statements which we should distinguish. First, there are explicit definitions. In an explicit definition, an, an, a concept like X is a bachelor is explicitly defined by means of a universally quantified equivalent, st equivalent statement or by implication statement. So some, for all X, if something is so and so, exactly then something is so and so. The concept left of the equivalence sign here is called the definiendum, the defined concept. It's an atomic concept which is defined. X is a bachelor. And the description on the right side of the equivalence sign is called the definience or the defining expression or defining phrase, which is a complex uh, concept. But the variables are the same as in the definiendum. So here, X is a bachelor exactly if and only if X is a hitherto unmarried man. That is the definition of a bachelor. By the way, this definition I, I owe to, to a friend of mine, Georg Dorn. Usually it's all, always said a bachelor is an unmarried man. That's the definition of a bachelor. But it's not really fully true because if someone was married and then is divorced and then he is a widower, the widower is not a bachelor, right? A bachelor is someone who is hitherto unmarried. So. Yeah. Uh, so that would be an explicit definition. The important point of an explicit definition is that you have an explicit definition of a concept, then you may eliminate the concept. Right? The concept may, in every place, in every occurrence, be eliminated by its definian, defining phrase. And this leads to a lot of certain theorems about explicit definitions satisfy certain properties. Satisfy certain properties which meaning postulate do not satisfy. So what is a meaning postulate? A meaning postulate is a, is a principle, is, a, is for instance an implication like here, which introduced as part of the meaning of the concept but is not does not have the form of a by implication of an equivalence, right? And therefore it doesn't make something eliminable here. For instance, if something is red, then it has a color. Right? That's a meaning postulate. I mean, you could think whether you can define having a color as a disjunction of being green or blue or red or whatever, but that wouldn't really work well because, I mean, colors are infinitely graded and each disjunction of that sort would be imperfect, would be, would have, uh, yeah, so it's better to have it in that form. Or something like, if something is round, it, ha it has no edges, right? That would be also a meaning postulate. Or if something is elliptic, it is round. If something is circular, it is round. And things like that, right? Meaning postulates. And you mentioned meaning postulates. If you go into mathematical axiom systems or into axiom systems, these axioms often have, do not have the form of explicit definitions, but if they are analytical, then they are meaning postulates. The third kind are derived analytically true or derived definitorily true sentences. You know, with definitorily true, I mean here a broader notion than explicit definition. I mean all three of them. But what does mean derived definitorily true? It just means these and these two 
things, explicit definition and meaning postulates are something like analytic axioms and then you can derive by means of logic from these analytic axioms, so to speak, analytic consequences like if somebody is a bachelor then he's male. And this is, this is uh, derived, right? It's derived from this definition here. So this is a derived logical two centers. Good. Now, let me finally come to two very central requirements on definitions. The first requirement is definitions must not be circular. That means, for one definition, the definiendum concept must not occur in the definience, right? For instance, if you define, if I want to know what is a genius, when is a person a genius, and I define a person is a genius if it's not the case that the person is not a genius, that would be not a good definition, right? So it uh, violates the non-circularity requirement. But more important, the non-circularity requirement is for systems of definition. They must form a chain such that no concept in, no defined concept in later parts of the chain occurs in the definience of earlier parts of the chain. Then that, that means non-circularity for systems of definitions. For instance, you can define something is necessary Necessary P if, if the negation is impossible. If not P is not possible, right? So then you define the notion of necessary with possibility. And then you are asked, but what does it mean that something is possible? Then you say that possible P, so P is possible, is equivalent with not. P, so not P here, the negation of P is not necessary. So you know these two uh, equivalences from modal logic, so this is a circular chain of definitions. Obviously these two definitions doesn't tell you anything about uh, what necessary means, when something is necessary. It just tells you what is the relation between possibility and necessity, but it doesn't tell you what, what it means to be necessary, because it's circular. The second requirement is the following. The second requirement says, and now, now we come to a more philosophically deeper point, um, definitions are analytic conventions, postulates of meaning, at least in my account of definitions or analytically analytic sentences. So definitorily true statements must not have empirical content. They must not produce empirical content. That is here the requirement. Um, so what so I mean when I say that definitions are conventions of meaning then I say they cannot be strictly said, they cannot strictly said to be true on empirical grounds. Um, that is a controversial question in philosophy, um, but I mean some philosophers have this platonistic idea that there is a true, the system of true definitions because there is a, a true classification of the world. Uh, uh, some some, some uh, platonistic conceptual system which we have to find. I don't have this opinion. It's not, it's not really what, 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 how scientists proceed. Classification systems and systems of definitions may be empirically more or less fruitful. That is for sure. Empirically fruitful or empirically adequate. And by the way, Carl Gustav Hempel was the one who pointed this out. Classification systems definition may of course be more or less empirically adequate, but they are not strictly speaking empirically true or false. Look at this example. Uh, I define like a fish, an animal who lives in the water is a fish. That was the original definition um, 
um, of a fish from a total from Aristotle to Linné. But what do we make with whales and dolphins? Well, for Aristotle and for Linné, they were fish. But then, uh, with Darwin's evolution theory, it was clear that dolphins and whales and so on, they are uh, uh, descending from mammals, and they have much more properties with mammals in common. So now they are not classified as fish, but as whales. But of course nobody can forbid you to define a notion of fish in that way that males are parts of fish, right? But it's of course more fruitful, and more empirically adequate to define whales and dolphins not as fish but as mammals. But just to give you another example, uh, for, which is really mm, controversial in, in contemporary systematic biology, from, evolutionary, from the viewpoint of evolutionary descent, yeah, from the evolutionary ancestor viewpoint of or evolutionary descendants, as you also say, birds uh, have much more in common with cocks than, say, with other uh, species. So, so quacks, or better to speak, squawks, crocodiles, uh, are much more uh, evolutionary closer to birds than do the rest of the amphibians, right, and the reptiles, like snails. So you really should classify not crocs with snails and, and other reptiles together, but you should classify crocs with birds. Some of the strict evolutionary uh, uh, systematics say, but, but that others, most of uh, systematic biologists say, no, that's that's nonsense. I mean, we don't classify it in that way because even if the evolutionary history of them is such and such, right, um, that, that they have a common descent, they have not, not enough properties in common. And so we don't put that into a joint category, cocks and birds. So in the, this example shows you that there's always a conventional element in, in classification system. And that's the reason why, why they are analytic. They are ultimately semantic conventions and, 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 and not true by empirical facts. Okay. So therefore we have the requirement that definitions uh, must not be empirically productive or creative they must not be creative in the following sense. They must neither have empirical content nor create new empirical content in combination with the given system of accepted background beliefs. So that is a requirement now. The second requirement on definitions. They must not have empirical content, that is clear, right? And they must not create empirical content in combination with the already accepted uh, 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 beliefs, in particular the already accepted analytic beliefs, the definitions which we have already accepted. And this requirement has an important implication and the following one. No concept may de be defined in two different ways. If you do that, then only one equivalent statement, right? One definition is a proper definition in the sense of being analytic, at most one. The other then is an empirical hypothesis. Here's an example. Assume I define meter in two times. One meter, the first definition is the length of a plate in iridium bar in Paris. This is the first definition of one meter. The second definition of one meter is one meter is the length of a pendulum at sea level with an oscillation frequency of one second. You know, this is also a possible definition of one meter, which is quite nice. And some people use it. It was actually used to estimate the height of mountains because then the oscillation period changes if you are not at sea level, right? But that is the second definition. Now, it's not allowed to accept both of these claims as analytically true because together they together produce the following empirical prediction. The length of the platen iridium bar or platen iridium bar in Paris equals the length of a pendulum at sea level with an oscillation frequency of one second. This is an empirical prediction which can be tested, right? So, and it's of course not possible that analytically two statements have empirical predictions 
And this shows you con uh, forcingly that only one of them can be considered as analytic and the other one must be considered as empirical then, as an empirical hypothesis. This remark is quite important also for using the, uh, the notion of definition in everyday language practice or also in science. For often, you know, science loosely says, well, this is our definition now of, of water. Say, water is H2O. But this is not, as I said, this cannot be a definition in the proper sense because water is already defined uh, in an ostensive way in everyday language, right? Many concepts are not explicitly defined, but just a primitive, uh, in, in the logical sense. They, these primitive concepts are, so to speak, defined by means of uh, ostension. This is water, this is water, and everything which is similar to it. So, so you see that since water is already characterized semantically as an observation concept, this liquid here, this cannot be a definition of water because it has already been defined. And so you see once again that this is a theoretical statement and uh, uh, that um, the distinction between analytic statements and synthetic statements, even if it is sometimes a vague distinction, is a crucial distinction in philosophy of science. And this concludes the talk of today. Thank you.